Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to our Friday morning Tyro MDS uh, program. Um, uh, I am Mark Erkin, and I am really excited about this morning's program, which is a really very, very um, thought provoking study that we will be reviewing in detail. Um, our presenter this morning is um, Dr. Lin Wa Yip from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, uh, it is really a pleasure to have her join us this morning to present this most important study. Um, she is an associate professor in the Division of Breast Endocrine Surgery and Surgical Oncology, as well as she holds a secondary appointment um, in the Clinical and Translational Science Institute. She also holds the title of Program Director for Complex General Surgical Oncology um, Fellowship Program and also serves as Chief of the Division of Breast and Endocrine Surgery. And I have the great pleasure of also um, introducing Dr. Laura Bukai, um, who is going to be this morning's discussant. She's an associate member at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, as well as an associate professor at Weill Cornell Medical College. Dr. Bukai is widely recognized for her clinical research in thyroid cancer, and in particular for her efforts uh, to understand some of the nuances of response to radioiodine therapy. Dr. Bukai serves on the editorial board of the Journal of, Endoc of the Endocrine Society and is an associate editor of Frontiers in Endocrinology. And so um, with that welcome, as always, I'd like to encourage all of our listeners to send in their questions. Um, unfortunately, last week we had far too many questions that I could get to, uh, which is a wonderful um, problem to have. But um, by the same token, um, I apologize to those whose questions did not get answered. So with that, I'm not gonna waste any more time um, I will uh, uh, turn over the program to um, Dr. Yip and then followed by Dr. Bukai. So thank you both very much here. Great, thank you so much. Um, let me share my screen. All right, well, thank you so much. I um, really is a pleasure to be asked to present this paper. Um, it, uh, I agree, it was really a, sort of a, a monumental um, uh, sort of undertaking, and uh, I, I can't really take all the credit for it. Um, it's really, I think, the, all the heavy lifting has been done by um, Dr. Uh, Ming Zhao uh, Ching, who I think we all know. He was at Hopkins for many years and just recently left to be the dean of a new medical school in uh, Shenzhen, uh, China. So he uh, is really the person who is behind this multi-center international study uh, cohort that uh, has been going on for about five or six years. Um, and uh, just to give you, um, I think, a little bit of background about the, about the group, um, the first paper that we published was back in 2013, uh, and this was a study looking at um, the association between BRAF V600E mutation and mortality in patients with papillary thyroid cancer. Um, and this included about 1,800 patients. Um, the majority of the patients were from the United States. And um, he, I think what he did, to be honest, is that he just uh, sort of looked in the literature around that time for people who were publishing on BRAF and then reached out to them directly, which is how he got in touch with us, um, to say, hey, I, this is really interesting. I think these are really important patients. Um, perhaps we can um, collaborate and make sure that we maintain a database of these patients and, and continue to look at them, which I thought was a great idea. And, um, and, and, and I thought uh, this first paper was actually really uh, quite interesting. So in that initial paper, just to give you a little bit of background, it included 1,850 patients with PTC and known BRAF B600E status. At the time, we were doing uh, BRAF uh, by Sanger sequencing, um, so a little bit of an old school way of, of checking. And in that paper, there, there were a lot of data points, but essentially what we saw is that um, there was a difference in PTC-specific survival uh, by BRAF status. And we stratified it by both um, all patients, as you can see here on the left side, and then and he uh, looked a little bit more uh, in the subset analysis in patients with conventional PTC, since um, most patients with uh, BRAF are conventional uh, PTC patients. And you can see there are p-values. Now, of course, um, 
we all know that, it, uh, you know, looking at so many patients that uh, even small differences that may or may not be clinically significant can uh, result in p-values. And certainly, if you look at the, at the raw numbers, the overall PTC-related mortality was only 3% in this cohort. Um, and uh, in the conventional, you're really seeing a difference of 1% versus 5% uh, in terms of mortality rate by BRAF status. And so I think, you know, it certainly was interesting, um, but um, I think looking at some of those raw numbers are really helpful. And uh, we'll do that again in this uh, particular paper as well. Um, the other interesting thing that we saw in this data set is that um, when we further adjusted uh, for covariates that are classically thought to be associated with mortality, things like lymph node metastases, di uh, distant metastases, extrathyroid extension, um, BRAF was no longer really uh, quite associated with mortality uh, as strongly as we thought it was. And so I think it's, it's helpful uh, as a marker, but um, sometimes those histologic features are, are a little bit more uh, predictive. Uh, at least that was a take home point from that particular study. And so since then, since 2013, there have been um, six or seven additional papers, including the present one, and they, they're all looking at very similar things. So stratifying uh, outcomes by, uh, by BRAF and uh, different uh, clinical features such as age, uh, male gender. Um, there were a couple of papers looking at uh, whether we should use BRAF to stratify active surveillance versus no active surveillance. And I think the, they're all using the same uh, data sets and they all had, I think, interesting uh, information. But coming back to the present study, which was just uh, published uh, last year in JCEM, uh, this was really looking at uh, lymph node metastases associated mortality in PTC uh, among uh, stratified by BRAF. And so this is a little bit of a bigger cohort than the initial cohort. It was 2,600 patients. Again, uh, all were PTC and all had BRAF V600E uh, testing. Um, it included uh, patients from six different countries uh, and 11 different sites. And the majority, uh, as expected, were from the US uh, and the majority actually were out of uh, Johns Hopkins, where uh, Ming Zhao uh, is locate, was located. Um, the median follow-up in this cohort was 58 months, so a pretty robust uh, follow-up, uh, but a pretty wide interquartile uh, range. Um, lymph node metastases were found in about 34%, uh, and the primary outcomes were PTC recurrence using uh, standard biochemical and structural definitions and disease-specific mortality, so uh, thyroid-specific mortality. And again, uh, BRAF was done uh, through uh, Sanger sequencing. So the results, um, point one is uh, we just basically verify that lymph node metastases uh, is associated with both PTC recurrence and mortality. This is just some of the data points. They're all uh, p-values. So on the uh, middle column are the patients without uh, lymph node metastases, and this is the patients with lymph node metastases. Um, there were more aggressive features seen in patients who had lymph node metastases, including extrathyroidal extension, tumor stage, uh, higher tumor stage, distant metastases, um, and uh, subsequently, of course, recurrence and mortality. This is unadjusted uh, with all significant p-values. Um, so this is really just confirming what we already all know. Um, and uh, when we looked at a uh, subset of conventional PTCs, again, the same associations were seen with lymph node metastases. Um, so the second uh, point of the results was to look at um, whether BRAF uh, stratified uh, lymph node metastases and other aggressive uh, histologic features. Um, so in this data set of uh, 2,600 patients, uh, about 1,000 of 42% were BRAF V600D positive, which is about the um, percentage that we typically see in many other papers. Um, among the subset of just conventional papillaries, it was about 47%, again, a little bit enriched in this uh, cohort. Um, about 53% uh, had lymph node metastases, and it seemed like BRAF was associated with lymph node metastases. That uh, p-value was quite significant. Um, but BRAF also seemed to be associated with um, other things, of course, uh, larger tumor size, T-stage, uh, higher T-stage and distant metastases, and lymph node metastases were also associated with these aggressive histologic features. So I think there wasn't much to conclude except that, you know, just like we saw with lymph node metastases and other papers, BRAF um, seems to be associated with these more aggressive features, uh, even in the subset of patients who had lymph node metastases. So um, basically a subset of a subset. Um, and then uh, we looked a little bit further on just uh, adverse outcomes. So, so the primary outcomes, 
And um, here, uh, it seems like, um, so this is the hazard ratios of lymph node metastases versus non-lymph node metastases adjusted for uh, the typical variables, gender, age, tumor size, multifocality, extrathyroid extension, and I-131 treatment. And you can see that the presence of lymph node metastases was associated with uh, recurrence. Um, and it seemed like it was pretty, uh, not, you know, not super different between the wild type BRAF versus the BRAF E600E. So whenever you have lymph node metastases, regardless of whether or not you have BRAF, it seems like it's associated with recurrence. And that seems to hold true even among the subset of conventional uh, patients. Um, when we look at mortality, however, um, it seems that the presence of lymph node metastases uh, is associated with um, mortality in all patients, but in the subset of conventional PTCs, um, wild type BRAF and lymph node metastases was not associated with disease specific mortality. However, in the subset of patients who have BRAF E600E, it was associated with mortality. Um, and so the, the Fourth conclusion was thus that mortality um, seemed to be particularly associated with patients who had both BRAF CP600E and uh, lymph node metastases. And you can see these are the Kaplan Meier curves. Um, this is the cohort of all uh, papillary thyroid uh, cancer patients. This red line is the line of patients who have BRAF CP600E and lymph node metastases. And then these three other lines are the other lines. Here are the um, absolute numbers there. And then um, it's even more notable, I think, in the conventional group, as we saw in a previous slide. Um, in only in um, patients who had BRAF e 600 e and lymph metastases did we actually see a significant change or, or significant decrease in, in disease-specific uh, sorry disease-specific survival in, in this cohort. Now, um, overall, again, we're looking at uh, low numbers. So the overall mortality rate in this cohort was 2.2%. Um, so 0.3% to 1.4% in the other three groups, uh, and still pretty low, 7.7% in that patient cohort group with um, mutant BRAF and lymph node metastases. So the study conclusions are that lymph node metastases associated with occurrence, again, not sort of uh, groundbreaking. We all know that already from other studies. Um, it seems like there's a variable association with uh, lymph node metastases with mortality. And then it seems like it stratifies a little bit further out by, um, by uh, BRAF status. So particularly in conventional papillary thyroid cancers, when you have wild type BRAF and lymph node metastases, this does not seem to be associated with mortality, but the presence of both the mutation and also lymph node metastases are associated with mortality. And so there, there are points in the discussion about, you know, is there um, some added prognostic significance uh, of lymph node status uh, related to survival? Uh, and it again brings around this sort of age old question of whether or not we should be doing prophylactic CNDs when BRAF B600E is present, and really for prognostic reasons uh, versus, you know, therapeutic reasons. Um, I think this is debatable. I, I know I, I'm not sure that I completely agree with that. Um, and certainly we can talk about that a little bit further. There are many limitations to this study. Um, we're really only looking at BRAF here, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the other uh, important mutations in a second. Um, all lymph nodes were lumped into one category, so we don't really know if these are central or lateral, if they were, um, if this, these were taken out therapeutically or prophylactically. And I think that that is an important point. Um, we certainly know that there are a lot of microscopic um, uh, lymph node uh, metastases uh, deposits that aren't necessarily clinically significant, and being able to stratify which uh, of these lymph nodes are really really in those categories, I think is, is ultimately going to be important. Uh, and along that same line, not everybody got uh, a lymph node dissection. And so is there any, are we just really talking about macroscopic disease or, or do we really care about occult lymph node metastases, which is what really prophylactic node dissections are really looking at. Um, so I think, you know, before making any, I think, clinical decisions, I think there's still some, some outstanding questions that remain to be uh, discussed, which I'm sure uh, Dr. Bukai will talk a little bit further about. Um, but I think the other, you know, as, as just to briefly go through sort of the, the impact of other molecular markers, I think um, BRAF is a very helpful marker. It is by no means, you know, the whole story. And we know this from many other studies. This is uh, older data looking at TERT uh, promoter mutations. Um, we see that the presence of um, even just TERT alone can increase recurrence. And then um, with 
BRAF and TER that increases recurrence. You can see in this middle figure um, increased mortality seen in this cohort. And even among the subset of patients who have ATA high risk patients, the presence of TER is a huge uh, uh, predictor of uh, poor outcome overall. Um, interestingly, the TER prevalence in these ATA high risk patients is about 11%, um, which is what I think we often see in terms of poor outcomes in this uh, subset of patients. Um, and we've actually looked at this a little bit further, you know, whether there's a molecular signature for aggressive DTC in a study that we just recently published. Um, we defined in this study uh, aggressiveness as being the presence of distant metastases. Uh, we used uh, next-gen sequencing uh, of uh, 62 differentiated thyroid cancers, all with distant metastases. And I think the take-home point in this slide is that in this first column, you can see that um, there were, most of these cancers were uh, BRAF positive, but they were very, very rarely isolated BRAF. So most of these had a late secondary hit mutation in either ter mostly TERT, but also P53, AKT1, and PIK3CA. Um, so I think that the that the presence of BRAF alone is is probably not going to be um, the full story whatsoever. Um, and then we looked a little bit further, we case matched these uh, patients to patients who did not have distant metastases and uh, just further defined that high risk uh, signature and found that most of these, as you can see here on the left, most of these had either TERT, uh, the concurrence of PIK3CA uh, and then multiple fusion mutations. So not just uh, BRAF alone. And so I think I'm gonna um, sort of end with this, uh, but the, uh, I think that the, the aggressive molecular signature is really uh, may include BRAF, um, but I think that uh, the addition of other uh, mutations, I think is, is important in terms of defining exactly what are these high risk uh, patients that are not gonna do well uh, with differentiated papillary cancer. All right, I'm gonna end there and let Dr. Bukai. Thank you, Linwa, can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, it seems like um, we could have the same slides on the same studies to discuss, so I'm happy to say that <laughs> uh, many of the things that you presented I am going to be discussing about. Well, certainly what I wanted to um, uh, discuss is that this was a major endeavor, and congratulations on that because there are very few uh, groups around the world who can get um, six different countries um, all together with 2,000 patients um, and, and follow them up for five years. But one of the most remarkable aspects of the study to me was that at the time that the study was started, like around five years or more ago, um, it wasn't... Um, that common that we were genotyping everybody. And this was done specifically on every single patient to try and identify outcomes. And so the, um, uh, the point that I want to make with this is that it's not a BRAF mutation that was found after the fact because the patients had a poorer prognosis. It's not that um, these centers follow their patients and whoever gets more complicated develops distant metastasis or lymph node metastasis or um, is advanced, um, gets genotyped and gets the BRAF um, uh, mutation detected. It seems from the way it's um, written in this study and the way it was described in the initial study <clears throat> that all the cohort gets genotyped and then we grab the subset of people who are BRAF mutant and BRAF wild type. Is that accurate, Lingua? Right. So we don't know whether they're going to have a good outcome or a, 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 a not, a, not a good outcome. Um, the type of surgery, as you um, rightly pointed out, is um, a, a, a mild limitation of the study. You know, um, we if this was truly um, we all know that thyroid cancer is a surgical disease, right? Um, Mike Tuttle and everybody have been saying, and Mark Erkin have been saying, um, the most important way of curing thyroid cancer is with the first initial good surgery. And, um, and, and that's where the recurrence rates come from, and that's where the mortality rates come from as well. Um, you know, if we have a very good first surgery, chances of having a recurrence and depending on the type of tumor that we have are going to be lower. So 
you know, the fact that some patients had prophylactic neck dissection, other patients had just a central neck dissection, other patients had a lateral and a central neck dissection, may confound the finding of um, uh, lymph node metastasis. From the microcarcinoma studies, we know that um, in autopsy studies, uh, most of microcarcinomas are accompanied by um, uh, non-clinical evident lymph node metastasis in the central compartment. About 50 to 80 percent of these microcarcinomas have um, lymph node metastasis. And if we were to do prophylactic neck dissections on all of these patients, we would find positive lymph nodes on all of these uh, um, uh, patients. So the question is, um, when do they become clinically apparent and when do they have um, relevance um, in terms of recurrence rates and mortality rates? Um, these are some of the open questions that haven't really been answered um, so far and that we need these kinds of studies to parse out and see, okay, these are the lymph nodes that matter, the clinically important lymph nodes like the ATA risk stratification system says more than three centimeters in size with extra nodal extension are the ones that are at high risk of recurrence um, in most uh, 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 studies. And so, um, put the patients at high risk of recurrence. And so um, we have to really understand the type of surgery that is done and the quality of the lymph nodes. And I bet you that in subsequent iterations of the um, ATA guidelines, we're going to definitely see um, the ratio of uh, lymph nodes positive to the ratio of lymph nodes removed um, as part of this um, uh, attempt to better risk stratify um, these questions. And, um, and you know, one of the, the most interesting aspects is that historically Masaferri and, and Jaitin Shah have published that the lymph nodes were not associated with recurrence and mortality, but all the recent staging systems, including the AJCC, the ATA risk stratification system, um, regard the lymph nodes as um, a critical variable to predict um, um, uh, recurrence and mortality. And so the point of this study <clears throat> is truly to refine the impact of these lymph nodes on the two major outcomes on um, recurrence and mortality. And as Linwa mentioned, um, the recurrence outcomes were met um, both by um, lymph nodes alone in the entire cohort um, uh, when they were wild type for BRAF or when they were mutated for uh, BRAF. But I wanna bring your attention to something that is um, dear to my heart because it's pure statistics and I, um, I, and I kind of um, like to look at the numbers um, a little bit um, closer. And so this is what you um, get when you adjust for uh, a BRAF mutation. Basically the coefficient of the um, uh, uh, survival analysis here changes from uh, six to four. Um, what that means is that basically BRAF explains part of the um, reason why positive lymph nodes are associated with distant metastasis. It doesn't explain it completely. There are other variables in all PTCs that um, uh, are, are needed to explain the effect of lymph nodes on these outcomes. And Linwan mentioned um, extrathyroid extension and distant metastasis and um, uh, tumor size and those of radioactive iodine given. The same happens in uh, the case of classic PTCs. The um, coefficient changes. And um, what this means is that the BRAF mutation by itself may explain a little bit of the association, but there are other um, uh, uh, variables that are involved in explaining this um, association between lymph node positivity and uh, recurrence rates. But most importantly, I think, is to bring your attention to the mortality outcome. And, and this really caught my attention. And I, um, I, was, I was trying to really understand what these um, uh, mortality numbers mean. Um, you know, Linwa presented that the overall mortality rate was very low. Um, uh, in the order of 0.2, 1.4%, as high as 7% when the patients have the combination of BRAF mutations and lymph node metastasis, metastasis positivity. But look at these adjusted hazard ratios on this column. Um, 
um, where we can better define um, the effect of um, BRAF alone, lymph nodes alone, and the combination of the two. Um, in the first hazard ratio, we see that lymph nodes alone in the entire cohort, all uh, papillary thyroid cancers, not um, classic papillaries, are indeed associated with mortality when adjusted for sex, for patient age, for tumor size, multifocality, extrathyroid extension, and iodine treatment. And, and that is what the AJCC and the ATA risk stratification says. If you have lymph node metastasis, especially when they are numerous, um, you are at increased risk of um, mortality. Now, BRAF alone does not really explain or is not significantly associated with mortality when adjusted by all these variables. And this is um, consistent with their initial paper published in JAMA, um, where uh, uh, lymph node, when lymph nodes metastasis are um, adjusted for extrathyroid extension, distant metastasis are also included in the model, the BRAF association is no longer significant. Now, my question to Linwa and, and, and a little bit of an open question to the group is um, the, this following association, right? We see that the presence of BRAF mutation and lymph node metastasis significantly and synergistically increase the ratio of um, uh, the, the, the risk of mortality. What do people die from? Um, people die from distant metastasis. People die from local recurrence of disease, invasive disease. The question is, why are these models not adjusted for distant metastasis? Why are these models excluding the adjustment of distant metastasis? In the initial paper, um, it was um, adjusted by distant metastasis and then the association, sorry, I, I need to go back, and the association of BRAF with um, a mortality was no longer significant. Is there any thought of um, you know, why were distant metastases excluded from this adjustment analysis when they were disparate in the groups with and without um, lymph nodes? Any, any, any ideas, Linwa? I can't answer that question. Um, Ming, Ming Zhao did the analysis. Um, you asked a very good question. I don't, I, and it was discussed in our group. I don't recall what his answer was, but I, he did not include the adjustment for that. The, um, so it would be really interesting to see what happens when we adjust these models of survival by distant metastasis, particularly because of the study that you conducted. Um, the study that you conducted is basically uh, based on the very fact that distant metastasis predict mortality. And that's the major driver of mortality in all cities. I mean, when we look at the hazard ratios of distant metastasis compared to any other variable um, in thyroid cancer, distant metastasis by far explain uh, many of the disease-specific deaths. And as Lingwan mentioned before, in the case of BRAF mutations, um, when you match patients with distant metastasis and uh, without distant metastasis, you see that the concomitant um, uh, appearance of other um, mutations, including TERT, P53, PIK3CA, um, are needed to um, provide this um, aggressive behavior to, um, to tumors. But I want to um, kind of switch gears a little bit and talk to you um, a little bit about um, about BRAF and, and the fact that we've been regarding BRAF as this um, master driver mutation that um, accompanied by TERT and by PIK3CA um, is uh, really bad. Um, but, I, but, I, but I want to um, you know, provoke your thoughts a little bit um, by, by, present you, by presenting you um, um, some, some more information that we have on BRAF. Um, everybody knows that classic or tall cell variant papillary thyroid cancer signals through the MAP kinase pathway, and it increases dramatically the uh, transduction through ERK and um, the 
uh, insensitivity to a negative feedback is what makes um, this um, uh, uh, flow uh, become not uh, tempered. And so the higher ERK transcriptional program results in uh, decreased differentiation genes. Um, this doesn't so much happen with RAS mutations or with uh, red fusions because um, the proteins that are mutated are still susceptible to a negative feedback from downstream regulators that temper the flow through the MAP kinase pathway. And therefore the ERK transcription program is less and thyroid differentiated genes um, remain preserved and expressed in cells. Um, so this is the molecular profile of TCGA. You've seen it a hundred million times, um, but here it is again, um, 500 uh, papillary thyroid cancers, about 60% of which um, had this BRAF B600 E mutation. But let me overlap on top of um, uh, this uh, panel, a panel that is not really circulated because it appears on figure um, five of the cell paper um, initially published by TCGA, but, um, but not in this format. This is an earlier format that makes it uh, more clearly um, uh, 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 identify the message that I want to give you. Among all the BRAF um, uh, samples isolated in TCGA, again, papillary thyroid cancers, um, there were about 80% of tumors with down regulation of iodine metabolism genes. These are sodium iodine importer, thyroglobulin, TPO, diiodinases, um, you name it. All the genes that compose the thyroid differentiation score were down regulated in 80% of BRAF mutant tumors. And this obviously explains their general insensitivity to radioactive iodine in tall cell variants, the, um, the less response to um, producing thyroglobulin. But guess what? About 20% of BRAF mutant patients have preservation of these iodine metabolism genes. And this preservation of iodine metabolism genes is very much like the RAS mutant um, uh, 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 tumors. They have preservation of sodium iodine importer. They produce good amounts of thyroglobulin. They are susceptible to being destroyed with radioactive iodine. Interestingly, many microRNAs are associated with these um, uh, two different subgroups of BRAF. So whenever we think of BRAF mutant thyroid cancer, start thinking that there are indeed two subpopulations of BRAF thyroid cancers. 80% are the ones that are um, the typical BRAF that we know, large tumors with insensitive to radioactive iodine, and 20% have preserved uh, responsiveness to radioactive iodine, and, um, and, and, and they may behave a little bit more RAS-like. And we um, looked at this in a little bit more detail. Um, sorry if you cannot see the entire screen, but, um, but this is what we found. Um, these are the real numbers of TCGA, um, a total of 227 patients and um, uh, the ones with, uh, that we named BRAF TDS low. Those are the green um, samples that have done regulation of iodine metabolism genes, about 80% of the sample. And the BRAF TDS high are the ones with the preserved expression of iodine metabolism genes. So there weren't any differences in terms of age. Um, Interestingly, um, and following up on Julian Sosa's um, disparities talk, um, Blacks and Hispanics um, composed the majority of, um, or, or were overrepresented in the BRAF TDS low, and Asians uh, uh, composed up to a fifth of the BRAF TDS high um, tumors. There were no difference in sex, no difference in past medical history, history of Hashimoto's disease, or prior radiation exposure. But look at these pathologic characteristics. Basically, BRAF tumors um, that have down regulation of iodine metabolism genes are larger. They have more um, a higher pathologic stage. They have more lymph nodes and they have a um, higher rate of distant metastasis. 
And uh, this is remarkable, right? Because we think of BRAF as a single group of patients, we really have to start um, understanding that there are two different subpopulations of BRAF that um, may not behave the same way. We looked at this a little bit um, uh, closer, and this is published online on uh, JCEM. It was uh, accepted in, in November of uh, 2021. I think it's going to come out with a with a proper um, uh, thing now in January, February 2022. Um, but um, but what we found was that some genes um, distinguish. Um, this um, uh, uh, BRAF subtype of patients with downregulation of iodine metabolism genes from the um, BRAF TDS high tumors that have preservation of iodine metabolism genes. And you can imagine that many of these genes are part of the thyroid differentiation score genes, um, TPO, the iodinases, um, MITIG. Um, but there are a couple of critical genes that um, are involved in cell polarity and the follicular structure of the cell that are overrepresented in BRAF TDS high um, uh, tumors. Um, those are CDH16, PDHDL1, TTF3. TTF3 is one of the genes that, um, TFF3 is one of the genes that has been associated between distinguishing uh, malignant from benign um, thyroid cancers. Um, uh, Yurini Kiforov and others have done um, uh, studies on uh, TFF3. But most interestingly, there are other microRNAs also associated with this distinction, distinctive um, uh, group of two sub different subtypes of uh, BRAF mutant tumors um, that target um, the TGF beta pathway. The TGF beta pathway has been associated with decreased thyroid differentiation and supposedly the overrepresentation of um, uh, microRNAs in the BRAF TDS high subgroup may explain their um, better differentiation or RAS-like features. Um, so um, we went ahead and tried to um, uh, understand whether these two groups um, behaved um, differently in terms of outcomes. And it turns out that yes, indeed, when um, you had a complete responders of uh, radioactive iodine, they had a higher thyroid differentiation score compared to those incomplete responders, and those were enriched with uh, BRAF TDS high tumors, and um, their BRAF RAS score was also higher. We grabbed an externally, uh, external cohort, MD Anderson, to validate these findings, and it turns out that they saw the same. Um, uh, complete responders um, had a higher TDS score than um, incomplete responders, and this is the MSK cohort. But again, um, you cannot use a single um, a cutoff point because each institution had its own baseline um, for um, distinction in um, uh, TDS cutoff. Above this cutoff, you are more likely to be a complete responder. Below this cutoff of TDS, you are most likely to be an incomplete responder. Um, the point is that um, indeed, within BRAF mutant tumors, there are uh, ways of predicting um, who will behave a little bit better or who will not um, uh, based on these differentiation genes. And so going back to um, uh, uh, Linwa study, and um, uh, I, want, I want to open up it for, for discussion, um, the BRAF um, uh, driver gene is an important factor that shows an increased um, risk of um, uh, mortality, but only when it's associated with other clinical pathologic characteristics. And that can include secondary heat mutations, distant metastasis, um, extrathyroid extension, presence of lymph nodes. Um, Lymph node metastasis, as we saw um, in uh, most of the uh, guidelines, are associated with an increased risk of mortality. But when they are linked to BRAF, this seems to confer an increased risk. The question is whether this risk persists when we adjust for distant metastasis. And then the last point that I want to make is that not all BRAF mutant patients behave the same. Some may be more RAS-like and with smaller tumors, um, less lymph nodes, and more susceptible.
treatment, more susceptible to TSH suppression and other post-surgical treatments. Another have more BRAF typical features where they are resistant um, to radioactive iodine and specifically when accompanied by concomitant mutations, they confer um, the more aggressive behavior to these tumors. And with that, I'm just going to end and open it up for questions from uh, the uh, attendees. Terrific. Um, thank you very much, uh, Limwa and Laura. Um, they, they both were truly outstanding presentations. I think before I get into further questions, I want to see if um, Limwa has any comments to what uh, Laura has just presented. You know, that was a fantastic talk. I think we um, we sort of recognize the same uh, sort of issues with the with the study, and I think that's just the nature of these large studies, you can get some good information from looking at 2,600 patients, but you certainly don't get the whole story and potentially just guides you towards looking at other things a little bit more deeper, um, as Dr. Bukai mentioned, um, with uh, sort of the molecular and looking at the TCGA data. But that was really, um, but we, I mean, I think it, it explains a lot of what we, we see about 20% of patients, uh, although probably in, in larger cohorts, that number may change a little bit um, in terms of who does well with BRAF tumors and who doesn't, uh, but certainly the BRAF alone is, is, is an ongoing question, I think, so. Great. Um, Limwat, um, can you, well, first of all, let me, let me just back up and go to 10,000 feet here. I think the question is, how do we use um, this data? And unfortunately, Laura's um, differentiation between these two subclasses of BRAF, <laughs> B600E cancers, really makes it very challenging. So <clears throat> I thought I had this really clear in my head um, and now it's clouded. So where do we go from here when we're trying to make clinical decisions? And um, I think that the real question becomes um, whether the thyroid differentiation score is something that we can, that, that is commercially available. Um, is that uh, because now it's no longer obviously BRAF B600E in a binary fashion, but we're gonna to have to dig deeper. Um, so maybe if you could just say, all right, so how are, how are you using BRAF B600E positivity um, in your management of your um, thyroid cancer patients? Yeah, so that question, it's a great question. I think it's still very undefined. Uh, um, we actually have a prospective uh, trial looking at specifically patients who have positive biopsies or suspicious biopsies um, and using um, the next-gen sequencing panel to determine low versus total uh, and further, you know, in subset looking at, you know, lymph node metastases. Now it's uh, for that particular trial, um, obviously we can't use recurrence and survival. We'd need too many patients to be able to get an outcome. So we're really using um, some of the histologic features as our primary outcome. Um, and so I think that question remains to be seen um, as to whether, you know, molecular, when you know that it's cancer should be directing clinical care and directing extent of surgery, that I, I don't know. Um, I do think that if you pick up TERT and BRAF preoperatively, then we are, I think it makes sense to treat those patients uh, aggressively. There's a high rate of distant metastases and those patients really should be getting right out to the iodine um, it, you know, in, in the long run. Uh, but otherwise I think the other questions are still a little bit unknown. Great. Um, we are, I would like to just quickly introduce uh, Dr. J.P. Brito and uh, Camilo Gonzalez uh, Velasquez, who um, were sitting on their hands as, um, uh, and wanted to uh, join in this conversation. So um, before I do, I, um, I invite their comments here. Um, you, you commented and Laura picked up on the differentiation that all lymph nodes are not created equal and that E&E &E was, um, uh, was parsed out in the discussion in your paper. But um, do you have any, was there any other information looking at other subsets of aggressive lymph node um, uh, variants based on the number, based on size, et cetera, that helped to inform um, the BRAF um, more aggressive variants here? 
Yeah, we didn't. We did not in the beginning um, collect, you know, that uh, that much data on the lymph nodes. So we, uh, as you might have surmised, in uh, collecting the data at the time, um, it was just a binary yes or no uh, answer. So I think um, there's definitely knowing that there's definitely room for bias in terms of which patients had lymph node metastases. Now, um, as as Dr. Bukai mentioned, you know, all these patients were had fairly routine. BRAF, um, and I can tell you that in 2008 and, uh, and, uh, and nine, when we were first doing BRAF testing and looking at some of the data, we were sometimes more aggressive surgically if we knew that it was BRAF up front. Obviously now we don't know if it makes sense to do that. So we're a little bit more, uh, I think, t- attenuated in, our, in what we do surgically. Um, but definitely at the time we were doing more prophylactic motor dissections, for example, for patients that we knew who were BRAF up front. So I think some of that will definitely cloud um, the data and the interpretation of, of that. Um, so. Great. Um, Laura, could, would you be able to comment on how you are using BRAF positivity and is everybody now who's BRAF positive getting a TDS um, in order to uh, move forward in their clinical management or is this not ready for prime time quite yet? It's, it's honestly not ready for prime time. And what we do is we do a TDS in our head um, every time we see a BRAF patient. And so when the single uh, solitary nodule comes um, biopsied um, with a BRAF mutation uh, without an associated um, third mutation, and it's completely resected with a lobectomy and has no aggressive features under the microscope, no uh, associated lymph nodes, um, you know, we don't do more than just regard the BRAF as it is. Yes, we have to sit down with patients and tell them, um, you know, this is a BRAF mutation that in the literature has been associated with worse prognosis, but only when accompanied by extrahural extension and lymph node metastasis and um, other concomitant mutations and distant metastasis. And so um, uh, we take the time to um, explain a little bit about the implications of the BRAF mutation alone. Now, when when it is BRAF and the patient does have distant metastasis of uh, or other aggressive features, we do try to get um, a complete genomic profile to understand what additional mutations the patients have, and not so much um, in 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 the shape of a TDS score, which is um, going to define a little bit whether we do um, radio active either in treatment or, um, uh, uh, or TSH suppression, but more so um, to understand whether we're going to use down the line redifferentiation therapies or um, a- a- other types of treatments. Um, when uh, uh, this, this distinction of TDS high and TDS low is honestly not in prime time because the um, Uh, we cannot create a signature with the low number of samples that we had. We weren't able to create a signature that absolutely distinguishes these two subgroups, but we recognize them by their behavior and we think about them differently. For example, if BRAF um, uh, mutant patients may have shown um, some uptake of iodine and then recurred, but over time they keep picking up iodine, well, that's unusual for a BRAF mutant classic papillary, which, you know, tends to not respond to radioactive iodine well. So we may give another dose of radioactive iodine in the, if we thought that they behave a little bit more rust like and they have preservation of iodine metabolism genes. Um, so the short answer is it's not ready f- to be clinically implemented. Um, Larger cohorts need to be analyzed with um, these uh, concomitant uh, uh, mutations and um, a signature might need to to be developed for us to be able to distinguish these different subtypes of BRAF. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna see if um, uh, if, uh, JP Brito um, or Dr. Gonzalez have uh, particular comments or questions? Yes, and, and um, uh, Lin Wo and Laura, fantastic presentations. First with the article and, and the paper that is extraordinary to re- enroll so many patients in a, a multi-center study uh, is impressive effort. And Laura, fantastic contextualization of the results. Um, 
I, I, I have, I think from the clinical perspective, I still a struggle with the timing of BRAF checking. So um, I, I understand the role of BRAF when we're thinking about targeted therapies or patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer. I think it's quite clear to me. But I still struggle when should we check BRAF in, in clinical practice. You mentioned already that sometimes you actually have the BRAF results at the time of deciding for surgery or deciding for additional therapy with radio radioactive iodine. Is this because they are coming with molecular testing that have you rough or is it because you are asking for it? Not at all. We would never ask for, for um, uh, genetic testing um, on, on, on nodal biopsies. You know, in uh, when, when people come with indeterminate nodules and they get a thydocic or an afirma or, or some, some uh, uh, tumor classifier, uh, 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 classifier outside, gen, gene classifier outside, they just come with the result of the BRAF. But we honestly still use the BRAF when we are thinking of redifferentiation therapies. That is, we, we, we don't, plan, the surgeons don't plan the surgery differently. Um, I don't think that they are at this point paying attention to the um, genetic component. If it's available, it might be an internal bias that they they do have and they might have a, 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 a proper way of, of, of making a, a better operation. But if it's a microcarcinoma with a BRAF mutation, they're still going to offer active surveillance and the, um, or the lobectomy to the patient. Yeah, I want to reiterate. So, so the, I, I completely agree. So we don't, um, the only time we get preoperative molecular testing as a standard of care is for indeterminate nodules in situations where we're not sure if we're going to operate or not operate. Um, Otherwise, if the biopsy is positive, the only time we get molecular testing is in the context of, of our prospective trial. And so those are patients who have maybe a one and a half, two centimeter thyroid nodule, completely um, encapsulated, no evidence of lymph node metastases, no reason to do an upfront total thyroidectomy to begin with. And the patient is equivocal as to whether or not they want a lobe or a total. We have a trial that they can potentially use molecular to decide lobe versus total based on that molecular profile. Will it help? I have no idea. And so that's why it's a prospective trial. Um, and so hopefully we'll be getting those results in the next year or so. We're almost done with accrual. Um, and so I'm hoping to be able to give you more information, but right now there's no reason if you have a positive um, biopsy to get molecular testing up front. Um, and just like Dr. Bukai, we use it for patients with advanced thyroid cancer um, to potentially look at targeted therapies if they're available and potentially to, um, to decide on redifferentiation uh, based on RAS versus, versus BRAF versus other mutations. Great. Lynn Wide, um, let me just push you a little bit further in terms of um, one of the, the, another point of speculation in your paper, in the discussion section, you uh, raised the point about um, potentially feeling comfortable to um, observe lymph node, recurrent lymph node metastases in the um, non-BRAF group versus the BRAF group where you might be a little bit more aggressive. Is that playing out here in terms of your management or you're still sort of in the speculation phase? I think that's just all speculation. I think, you know, we use, we do not currently use BRAF as a way to decide reoperation or not reoperation for recurrences. I think those are really based on um, patient factors, uh, clinical factors, disease factors. Um, so I think a lot of other things go into that decision making. In the perfect world, um, it would be nice if we could, I guess, and uh, potentially give rate out of iodine for some of these recurrences before we operate to see if they're, you know, if they're their uh, high versus low uh, differentiation. But uh, right now, I don't think there's any specific protocol for that, so. Great. Um, uh, Camilo, do you have any questions or comments this morning? Yeah, well, first of all, um, I would like to echo everybody on, uh, on congratulate, congratulating you on a great presentation. And while I was re listening to the lecture, um, Dr. Bukai presented the figure on the uh, overlap of BRAF and RAS mutations. And when you were explaining the potential subgroup of BRAF populations based on their iodine uh, metabolism, when we think of iodine metabolism, of course, we think about radio radioactive iodine uptake. But in your experience, have you seen any differences, for example, in the, do the levers that are actually in doses required to suppress the TSH in these patients, for example, to look at a different variable 
that might be easier to identify with, with within these two subgroups. Right. So the, that's the the next logical step to understand whether so TSH receptor. If you look at the side panel of the um, uh, figure that I presented is one of those genes and thyroglobulin is another one of those genes. And so um, the next logical step is to understand, okay, do we need to suppress every single BRAF because it's going to drive um, uh, decreased risk of um, recurrence? Well, maybe there's an 80% of this uh, BRAF mutant uh, patients who do not respond to TSH suppression and only 20% do benefit from this um, suppression of TSH. I think that that needs to be investigated. It's one of my interests as it has been all along um, uh, from the time that I've been studying TSH. But, um, you know, um, I, um, I think that there is a valid question there to ask, what are we doing in suppressing these tumors that have a complete downregulation of this TSH receptor and may be completely insensitive to this TSH suppression? Remains to be tested. I don't have the answer for that, but yes. Please do share your results when you have those. Yes. <laughs> hey, Laura, let me just follow up on something. So. Um... We have to bring you again to discuss that paper because I read it and it was it was fascinating. And I know that you have been working on the paper for a long time. So congratulations on that on that paper. Um, in the in practice, one of the issues that I see with radioactive iodine is sometimes we see the tumor taking up radioactive iodine, but we don't see any structural response. Right. Um, so, you know, because of the way that radioactive iodine gets into the cells, maybe there is not uh, assimilated, just pass it by. In your two cohorts, do you have in the cohort that have the BRAF uh, with low differentiation, do you see any uptake, for instance, of these patients but no response? Or were you able to say, oh, these patients don't take up and don't respond versus they is not take back and response? Just sure. trying to understand if that would be useful to understand radioactive iodine and refractory, refractory disease in downstream. Right. So these are so to remind you, these are patients who were submitted to the TCGA and they are classic papillary thyroid cancers, low risk. So for the most part, they are completely resected with an initial surgery and then given an adjuvant dose of radioactive iodine. And only if they have recurrent disease and you do a radioiodine uptake, will you get that response? There were so few of those in mm. that study that we cannot answer that question. And, I, and that was exactly my um, goal to be able to answer whether radioactive iodine is actually the, uh, the difference in these two groups, if it gets retained less or if it, um, you know, uh, what is it that, it's, is it uptake, is it retention? Is it what is it with the radioactive iodine that's different, be, different between these two? Not the appropriate cohort to study, simply because most patients had adjuvant therapy and they don't have uptake anywhere. You know, they just they, they mm -hmm. just have yeah, right. Terrific. Well, I want to thank um, everyone, um, particularly uh, um, Laura and Limwa for joining us this morning. These were truly outstanding. Uh, presentations, really thought provoking, and yes, um, brought up um, lots more questions for us to answer um, in uh, the weeks and months to come here. Um, I'd like to thank um, JP and Camilo for their comments, and certainly look forward to um, everyone joining us again next week. And um, uh, we will be having uh, Samantha Newman uh, discussing um, invasion of recurrent laryngeal nerve um, from small, well-differentiated papillary thyroid cancers. And so with this, um, uh, we will be signing off and everybody stay safe. And once again, thank you all for uh, being a part of our session this morning. Thank you.